Welcome to another corner of my apartment. And yes, I know my TV is small. It is my cats. I'm borrowing it while they're on vacation. Hello, and welcome to, or back to, my channel. I'm Kit, and today, Brad Cooper has hit a new low. Before we get into it, I would like to note that I don't know Brett, and these are my thoughts and opinions on the content she puts out for public consumption. That being said, thank you for clicking on this video, and I would like to give extra thanks to my patrons. Links to my socials and Patreon are below, along with sources and resources. And now, on to the reason we're all here. I didn't think she could be any worse, but here we are. Last week, Daily Wire employee Brett Cooper posted a video, Do Parents Hate Their Pets After They Have Kids? I don't know what prompted me to watch it. I assumed she would say the usual stuff about how after you have kids, you realize how important they are and so on, but instead she actually downplays, defends, animal abuse. I'm just going to get right into it. People are upset that this author wrote about the fact that after having her baby, she realized that she loved her baby more than she loved her cat. And all hell broke loose. I assume Brett read the article, but did she actually comprehend it? Honestly, I think she was more interested in the responses to it, which, well, that's weird. If you're going to give commentary on comments, why wouldn't you at least consider what people are commenting on? But of course. Now, once again, and unfortunately for them, I think that these women are just proving JD Vance and his cat lady comment right, because just wait until you hear these comments. And I think that this speaks to what our society values, animals versus mothers. That's quite a framing and not at all what people were upset about. The article in question is titled, why did I stop loving my cat when I had a baby? My postpartum loathing of Lucky made me wonder whether I might be a late onset psychopath. Published by Anonymous. Now basically the premise of this article is that this woman got her cat 10 years ago at a very different stage in her life. She was single, she was 24 years old, but then she got married at 30 and she now has a baby. And as all of these big developments and changes in her life occurred, the relationship between her and her cat became more and more tense. He didn't really like her husband. He was struggling when she moved houses. And then it inevitably ruptured, as she writes, when she had her baby. She wrote, birthing a child is an efficient way to shatter certain delusions while fostering a set of brand new ones. And pets seem to suffer from this shift. I don't know many pet having persons for whom the introduction of a baby didn't cause a plummeting of interest in the legacy mammal. In some cases, this disillusionment is temporary. In others, it's permanent. Cats being standoffish in nature tend to be grievously neglected. Dogs having non-negotiable daily needs are more often resented. And that is unfortunately exactly what happened in this family. This author, who is a very, very new mom, she is recently postpartum, is stressed. She is exhausted, obviously, because again, she is freshly postpartum and she did not have enough time or energy to help her cat adjust. Like this new mom might not even be able to remember or have the energy to feed herself, let alone her cat. And instead, as the cat demanded more and more attention, she became irritable and resentful to her cat. She pushed the cat off of her. She would forget to feed him at the right times, then downgrading to a less particular food so that it would be easier so she could just leave kibble out for the cat. She's threatened to get rid of the cat because he would claw all over the duvet and puke on her breastfeeding bra while she was trying to nurse her baby. And I'll be honest, guys, when I read the comments, I thought for sure this was gonna be overblown. It was a hard read. It was incredibly uncomfortable to read all of this as somebody who loves animals, who has pets, who wants to be a mother, hopefully soon. But the good thing about it was that it was very raw and it was very honest because animals struggle with adjustment just like humans. And when humans bring home a baby, things change for literally every living being in that household. Like this is a very common discussion that families have. And the author was being raw and vulnerable as she told this story. And this has sought help. She is trying to make things work with her beloved cat and her baby and make things harmonious. She does not want to resent her cat. She does not want to act this way to this animal. And that was basically the conclusion of the article, that she is trying to change this. Based on this, I'm thinking Brett didn't actually read the article. She just read a summary of it. And you know what? Let's read the actual article so we can see what people are blowing out of proportion. I'm going to give a content warning here because despite what Brett thinks, it is bad. Why did I stop loving my cat when I had a baby? Summer in New York, sunny Thursday in the park. A ponytailed woman in the realm of 30 years old gazes into the middle distance. At her breast is a baby. Tied sloppily around one of her ankles is a leash and connected to the leash is a glossy auburn dog standing a few feet away, morosely examining a piece of trash. When the dog gets bored with the trash, he trots back to his owner and begins to tentatively hump her leg. Alert to any change of movement, the baby detaches from her mother with a squirm and a wail. The dog quickens his hip thrust into exuberant plunges until the owner stares daggers down and says, loudly and clearly into the judgmental Brooklyn air, fuck off. And off he fucked that little dog. I wouldn't have noticed any of this, except that I was sitting at the next bench over with my own baby, and I too became enraged at this dog whose humping had triggered a multi-organism chain reaction that ended in my own child bursting from tranquil sleep to fussy consciousness. 
A year ago, I would have been startled by the woman's vitriol as well as my own, but now it made sense. If I ponder the possibility of being humped by anything while engaged in the delicate process of nursing a baby, I think to myself, that way lies a psychotic episode. Birthing a child is an efficient way to shatter certain delusions while fostering a set of brand new ones and pets seem to suffer from this shift. I don't know many pet having persons for whom the introduction of a baby didn't cause a plummet of interest in the legacy mammal. In some cases, this disillusionment is temporary in others permanent. Cats, being standoffish in nature, tend to be grievously neglected. Dogs, having non-negotiable daily needs, are more often resented. The cost of a pet can become a special locus of bitterness. One parent, Audrey, not her real name, everyone in this story was granted a pseudonym, determined that $10,000 is the absolute upper limit of how much I would spend to save the dog's life, whereas my previous answer would have been infinity. It's so bad, Camilla, who has two children, told me. The dog needed surgery on her leg at the beginning of June, and I asked the vet if I could put her down instead. He looked at me like I was a mom. Monster. I shelled out $5,000 we don't have on the fucking dog instead of the millions of other things we needed it for. A few months ago, my friend Heidi was walking her dog down the street. The baby would have been like six months old. The dog was pulling and barking and being annoying in general, she told me. And I very audibly said, I wish you would die. I got my own cat, Lucky, 10 years ago. It was an act of selfishness. I was a lonely 24-year-old who craved on-demand love from an adorable creature. It was clear to friends and family that Lucky, like most or all cats, was only intermittently tolerant of me, much less loving. But my brain was a capable converter of her routine activities into evidence of affection. It didn't bother me when Lucky shredded the furniture to smithereens since it was all secondhand Ikea stuff anyway, a mere step up from garbage. She slept on my pillow every night. I combed her for hours every week with a miniature kitty comb. I purchased bottles of sustainably harvested fish oil because it promised to prevent heart disease or something. On cold days, Lucky napped on a tartan cashmere blanket beside a space heater set up for her at the foot of the table where I worked. All of my disposable income went toward fancy cat food and wholesome toys. The cat arrived, in other words, during a period when I was not thinking of the future, which is the whole point of your 20s. Nonetheless, the future occurred. When I got married at 30, Lucky took an active and territorial dislike to my husband. It was unpleasant, but manageable for everyone. A few years later, we had a baby, and my postpartum loathing of Lucky made me wonder whether I might be a late-onset psychopath. In the months following the baby's arrival, any redirection of attention sparked fury. If Lucky nuzzled me as I nursed in bed, I shoved her away. When she barfed on a nursing bra, I threw a soiled garment at her head and missed. When she threaded through my legs in figure eights during diaper changes, I could barely suppress the urge to not kick, but firmly scoot her away with a foot. I didn't, I didn't. Basic needs went unmet. I often forgot to feed Lucky, which caused her to eat houseplants in desperation and puke them up. She shat and urinated on the floor in protest of her overflowing litter box. A few weeks in, I abandoned the effort of wet food altogether and placed a trough of dry food in a corner. Lucky binged and gained a statistically significant amount of weight, which made it impossible for her to self-groom, leaving her greasy and coated in dandruff. She lost at least one tooth. No idea where it went. I forgot to fill her water bowl, which I didn't realize until I saw paw prints all over the toilet seat, her hydration source of last resort. The toilet paw prints broke my heart a little bit. If I treated a human the way I treated my cat, I would be in prison for years. Eventually, Lucky gave up and became depressed. Her movements changed. She skulked around the baby, slept in a sad, cowering position, hesitated before approaching her food, eyed me with an uninterpretable but distinctly negative affect. These observations about her condition coexisted with an unwillingness on my part to change anything about it. By the time the baby was two months old, I hated Lucky so much, I began to leave our windows open in the vague hope that she would take the initiative and leap out of one. Not directly to her death, we live on the ground floor, so a level of plausible deniability factored into my calculations, but realistically, to her death. Call it voluntary cat slaughter. Looking back, I realized our dog was like a practice baby, said Cynthia, now a mother of three. She took the dog to work with her, her husband cuddled him after she went to sleep. Before giving birth to a daughter, Laurel told me, she and her partner poured all our dormant parent energy into the dog. They bought doggy outfits, took the pup on vacations, photographed her daily. Then the baby came, the real baby. No more hour-long walks and photo shoots. Instead of curling up next to Laurel on the couch, the dog lurked at the opposite side of the room. I felt like I'd dissolved a four-year relationship, Laurel said. Like me, none of the women I spoke with had intentionally obtained her pet to use the animal as training wheels for a baby. None would think of seeing her pet in such frostily instrumental terms. They got their pets for all the usual sweet reasons. For a companionship, to offer a safe home to a rescue, because they'd grown up with pets. Just because a pet can function as a prototype baby doesn't mean it must, or that it is only that. But let's grant that it happens. You had a pet who was your baby, 
baby and now you have a baby who is your baby. Does that mean the pet is sentenced to irrelevance? The answer from most of my polling group was yes, but it's not a life sentence. More like one to five years with time off for good behavior. The common thread among their experiences was this. Parenthood inevitably alters a pet's position in the household, but the degree to which it does needn't be morally egregious. You may accept that your pet is no longer the primary recipient of love and resources while still according to the status of a cherished being. Wait it out, they implored me. Don't trust your feelings right now, said Cynthia. She promised my affection for Lucky would return once the baby started noticing and interacting with her. At three months old, my baby was of roughly equal size with my cat. Three months is when babies start tracking their environment, looking around, perceiving entities that do not have a nipple. It was around this time that I found myself perched on the bed one night trying to interest the baby in a dragon-shaped toy. The toy was new, a recently unwrapped gift from my sister. When the dragon was waggled, a bell sewn into its belly made a jingling sound. The baby didn't care for the dragon, but Lucky careered to the bed as soon as the toy's inner bell was activated. The jingling was similar to the sound my fingernails made when I drummed them against the radiator pipe near Lucky's food bowl, the signal that dinner was served. Having jumped onto the bed under false pretenses, Lucky froze. Her overgrown nails dug into the duvet cover. She stared at the dragon, the baby, me. Then back at the baby, who wobbled his head in the cat's direction. Lucky moved closer. For six or seven seconds, the two creatures stared at each other. A hint of the affection Cynthia predicted flared up in my chest, as did a flicker of irritation because now the cat had to be fed or watered or whatever. Then I remembered something that Natasha, a mother of two kids and one dog, had told me. Being irritable and not having enough love are two different things. At that moment, on the bed, both happened to be true. I did not have enough love for the cat and I was irritable, but that didn't mean one followed from the other. In fact, a mountain of evidence pointed to the opposite. Every person and animal I'd ever loved had caused me vexation and I knew myself to be a periodic or chronic irritant in the lives of my entire family, all my friends, my partner, and my colleagues. Yet none of them ever invited me to self-destruct. I haven't fallen back in love with Lucky, but it could still happen. I'll shut the windows until then. The conclusion was, well, maybe I don't want my cat to die, not I'm trying to change how I feel about my cat. She also doesn't say anything about the cat needing more attention. She actually wrote that Lucky was only intermittently tolerant of me. It was her perception of Lucky that changed. And that changed perception is what made her view Lucky's basic needs as an annoyance. And honestly, it's normal to feel frustrated. It's normal to get annoyed. It's normal to have less time. You don't have to buy the nicest pet food or wholesome toys, whatever those are, or spend hours a week brushing your pet. But neglecting their basic needs so much that they refuse to use the litter box, gain a ton of weight, start drinking from the toilet, that's animal neglect at best. And given the way she writes about the cat and how it skulked and cowered, I am wondering if there was more. And on that note, Brett thinks people missed the entire point of the article and lost their damn minds. Let's see what that looks like. Somebody on Reddit said, what a disgusting excuse of a human being. I pray this cat is found and taken away from the horrible abuse it has to endure. The Cut and New York Magazine have been platforming an animal abuser and I would like to bring attention to this. That story in the Cut about the woman who started neglecting her cat after her baby was born, who notices the cat is depressed and drinking out of the toilet because you didn't fill its water and doesn't think I need to rehome this animal yesterday. I am revolted and I hate her. Is someone able to find out this woman's information and get the cat out of her house? Has anyone tried? There has to be a way to contact the Cut and report this woman. Still disturbed by this article days after reading it. I have suspected for a while that Brett and other commentators like herself look for the worst comments they can find. Though, honestly, for an article about animal abuse, those are pretty tame. These are the four most uploaded comments from a subreddit post about the article and one I found interesting. I read this this morning and it made me sick to my stomach. I am not usually like this, but I canceled my subscription to NY Mag over it. I just think it reflects unbelievably badly on the editors. I cannot believe they paid this woman to write an essay detailing how she severely abused her cat. She demonstrates no empathy and the flippant jokes about it were so gross. Also, the husband is as big a piece of garbage as her. Who sees an animal suffering and does nothing? This woman needs a rescue to take that cat and intensive therapy. This was a horrific read and like others here, I noticed that the husband isn't mentioned and obviously isn't taking care of the cat. I wonder if these women come to resent their pets because they can't face the fact that they and their husband do not actually have 50-50 division of labor in the home slash relationship like they thought before they had kids. I am all about normalizing uncomfortable feelings, but you cannot torture an animal like this and sentence them to drink from a fucking toilet when you could buy a frigging water fountain that self-replenishes. I have so many questions. Like, is the husband in on this? Does he not care no one is feeding a creature 
future of their household. My partner would never fucking forgive me if I did this to a pet and he would jump in immediately if he saw I couldn't do X or Y with a pet. I saw on Twitter some women discuss complicated feelings about pets once kids enter. And I get that mothers in this country often have little help from the government and do not have social safety nets or family. But if you're struggling like this, you probably need to rehome your pet at the very minimum. The Cut apparently asked writers to pitch for this. So I guess the editors really are going for outrage for clicks now. I just don't understand why, instead of writing a really important article about PPD, PPR, we get a written confession to animal abuse. Like, wow, very helpful. Much contribution to society. Thank you. So I've been turning this over in my head since yesterday and the question I keep asking is this. Why is there a straight line drawn from loss of feelings of love to outright neglect and abuse? There are some missing steps that this essay completely ignores and it throws up some even more disturbing implications. I don't have any problem hearing about people's emotions changing toward their pets when they go through major life changes. The idea that having a baby reshuffles everything in a parent's heart and priorities is understandable and while it's sad to think that means some stop loving pets, I don't think it makes them monsters. But why would less love lead to abuse? Is the writer implying that she would abuse and harm any random animal who crossed her path just because she doesn't love them as an individual? It's possible to feed, hydrate, clean up after, and not bully a cat without loving it. It's more than possible to surrender a cat to a shelter or rescue with zero love in your heart. I give my cats basic care and look after their health because that's the commitment I took on when I brought them into my home. My love for them is huge, but it's a different part of the equation, not a prerequisite for giving them clean goddamn water. I know this for a fact because in the past, I've been a caregiver for a few different cats that I didn't much like. I didn't hate or resent them, but for various reasons, I didn't love them or look forward to interacting with them. But for the times that they were in my home, I gave them what they needed because it's what is required by basic human decency. So I'm left asking, does the writer lack basic human decency? Is her ability to care for other living beings dependent entirely on her level of love for them as individuals? If so, terrifying in its implications about how she will treat her kid as it grows and life changes? Or is she actually dealing with severe untreated PPD and ignoring that possibility in the essay and in life? Either way, there's something major missing here between the concept of I don't love my cat and the material reality of I stopped giving my cat proper food and water and fantasize about her dying. Brett goes on to tell us about how horrible the backlash was for the cut and how they had to publish a response about how they don't condone harm to animals and confirm the cat was healthy and taken care of before the article was published. I would like to know how they're defining healthy and taken care of, but anyway. The response included a note that harassment and threats towards staff and their family are unacceptable, which I agree with, but... What? I can't believe that I'm saying this because I feel like the bar is just on the ground, but I'm so glad that he is actually standing up for his writers and is not bending a knee and fully apologizing and like firing this person. What person? Are we to understand that the anonymous writer was actually someone on staff? Anyway, back to Brett. And maybe this just shows the differences in my values and my priorities. But when I read that article, I did not walk away thinking about the cat and how the cat is doing. I walked away thinking about the mom, the mom who is newly postpartum, whose hormones are obviously raging, who seems to be struggling possibly with postpartum depression, who obviously does not have ample support in her home or her community to help her and her cat get through this transition. Everyone has their own priorities and values, but why the need to act as though this was just a new mother struggling with loving her cat when it was actually so much worse? I guess she has to downplay it to make the point she wants to make, but watching Brett do backflips to rationalize and downplay this is just gross. And like I mentioned earlier, this is a very common and very commonly discussed problem for new mothers, especially in regards to their pre-existing pets. Look at these articles, one from Pop Sugar. Hate your pet after having a baby? Here's what to do, according to experts. What to expect when you're expecting has a blog post from 2023, postpartum rage about my dog. I'm being treated for postpartum rage, but does anyone else just hate their dog now? Another article, when new parents start hating their pets. That's from 2009. And then of course, guys, it's also all over Reddit with many moms sharing the original author sentiments. The original poster of this one said, I've been hating my dog ever since I gave birth. And people in the replies related because this happens to lots of mothers. It not being just this one person doesn't make it okay. And given that we don't actually read these articles and posts that Brett mentions, we don't know if they just didn't love their pet anymore or if they actually abused and or neglected them. And you know what? Let's not normalize animal neglect or animal abuse. One said, the dog aversion goes away. My pup was my absolute baby before I had my son, but a sleep deprivation kicked in. He was just another thing in my life demanding attention that I didn't have the energy to give. Like no wonder the author couldn't remember to give her cat water when she is barely sleeping, trying to feed and keep a living human being alive. Like that's not a crazy thing. None of what that New York Magazine author is writing about is abnormal. Any parents here? Is it normal or common for you to forget to give your pet water? Do you ever leave the windows open hoping your pet will jump to their death? I somehow doubt. 
As for Brett's conclusion, well, this woman's actions are because of society especially in a society that is more alienated than ever before. I mean, most young couples and new families live away from their families. New mothers have less support than they have ever had in historical societies. We are sick, we are unhealthy, we are literally drugged, and also fewer people than ever are having babies, which I'm sure can make the experience even more lonely for new moms and makes them feel like they're crazy when they experience something like this author is going through. I mean, no wonder the subtitle of this article is, am I having a psychotic break because I don't like my cats? I mean, she has nobody to relate to. Setting aside the fact that the author managed to ask other people how they felt about their pets after having a kid for her article, it's still not normal to neglect or abuse pets after having kids. Anyway, Brett calls for society to change and again defends the author. This author, even though the entire story was uncomfortable and it was hard to read what was going on in her home, she is not an animal abuser, nor should she be hated or canceled. I do feel for anyone who is struggling, regardless of the reason, but my sympathy does fly out the window when you neglect your pet to such an extreme, and I do feel a quiet sort of rage upon reading that this person left her windows open in the hopes that her cat would jump to its death. That is not normal, and no amount of insisting that it is will make it normal. And honestly, we shouldn't want it to be. And the author knows that. She admitted in the article that if she treated a person the way she treated her cat, she would be in prison for years. She should be offered support. I also don't want to point the finger, but she's married. Like, isn't there a man there who can take care of the cat while she's breastfeeding? Like, I just don't understand. She needs help. And as time goes on, if she and the baby and the cat never adjust, hopefully she can find him a wonderful home, free of babies, free of the stress, which would probably end up being the right thing for everyone, no matter how hard that would be in the moment. Because at the end of the day, and I'm sorry to break it to you cat ladies, but when you have a child, that becomes your priority. It seems like our society has forgotten that. I am a childless cat lady, and I understand that priorities can change after having kids. That does not mean abuse or neglect are now acceptable. And is this why Brett wanted to do this video? To try and take a shot at cat ladies? Oh, people are upset at this woman for writing about how she hates her cat after having a baby. Who cares what the article actually says? I'm going to reconfigure it for my own needs so I can tell people they have their priorities screwed up. And I do appreciate Brett, who has no kids, telling us how things are after having kids. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.